This episode of Super Boothers is brought to you by the Photo Booth Expo in Las Vegas this coming March 12th to March 14th, 2018 at the Westgate Hotel and Casino. Visit photoboothexpo.com and use promo code SUPERB2018 for a key pass or SUPERB2018E for an exhibits only pass. See you there. Hello and welcome to Super Boothers. My name is Ryan. And I'm Ismail. Today is Ismail's birthday. You, you had to even have the birthday before me, didn't you? You couldn't even give our, me that. Our birthdays are a week apart. Who the hell knew? Yeah, it's like we planned it. It's like we, we kind of got, like, got in sync with that, you know? Well, I mean, I do look younger. Yeah, I'll give you that. <laughs> so last week we just had a night in Gotham, and I'm so excited that everyone was able to make it. People really did come from far and wide. Yeah, it was amazing. I mean, I, I gotta say, honestly, I was very taken aback and humbled to see everyone that showed up and people, like there were people that paid a couple hundred bucks for a cab ride to get there, people that took trains from multiple hours away. I mean, it was very humbling to see everyone make that trek uh, to be in that room. So I think we walked away very energized from being there. It was it was really awesome just to kind of get to talk to people. I mean, because I like I said at the event, you know, here we are talking about whatever it is we're talking about for the week and we don't necessarily get to hear feedback i mean there are people that listen to us you know in the car and road trips people that listen to us cleaning their house people that (laughs) i mean it's just it was awesome to get to hear feedback yeah that's that's the thing with the internet and i listened to a lot of podcasts before starting this one and there's thousands of people listening to a show but majority of people don't like communicate back to you so when we're talking about stuff we don't know how people take it all the time not everyone not a high percentage of people talk back to us whether it's through messages or whatnot um so it was really good to see people and get their perspective on the show in person it's also so that's also something very difficult about doing a podcast is you know here we get to talk and say what we want to say with a live event Whenever I'm speaking, you know, I get a little feedback from people, even if they're not speaking, you know, people are nodding their heads, they're taking notes. With this, it's just like firing, you know, into the thin air. Um, Yeah, and kudos to Ryan. Ryan did a great segment on websites, and he actually audited a couple people's sites live there at the venue. Um, I was so depressed. So depressed. Because everyone had such good websites. (laughs) Like, I didn't have an opportunity to rip shit apart. Yeah, but I did see people taking a lot of notes during that segment, so that was that was good. That also is a testament to, I guess, everyone just kind of staying ahead of the curve and being able to, you know, know what is current and know what should be on your website. One of the things that I talked about was, you know, think of yourself as a consumer whenever you're looking at your website. Um, very often, we design for ourselves, and we really should be, you know, designing for our customers. I also like to see people there from different stages. Like there were some people that were full-time um, and just looking to improve. There were some people, that, there was one guy in particular, Elvis, I know you listen and shot you out, Elvis, um, who just started and is looking to get good advice on the beginning steps of getting into the business. Uh, so that was really cool to see people of all levels there. The food was amazing. I did hear good things about the food. I was, I truthfully, whenever we booked it, I thought to myself, okay, like this is like there's something for everyone. I did not expect it to be as amazing as Come on, it was. What I let you down? Well, <laughs> that what was it like a fried zucchini yeah, it was a fried thing? Zucchini. It was it, just for people who weren't there. It was a Turkish restaurant, so there was Mediterranean food. What was it called? Uh, in your like language, my language. <laughs> you're putting me in the spot here. Um, I don't remember. Swag bags were amazing. I'm so glad everyone really enjoyed them. We did a selfie light. Thank you so much to Brian Ginsburg. He donated a little license plate props for us i did a little notebook we did a pen and then the bag itself and your wife was actually using the the selfie light that came in yeah, handy she was the definitely next day. using it i think a lot of people really liked the selfie light and i actually thought the swag bag itself was very cool i picked the black and white color because i think that represents brooklyn and new york very well for people who are not from here jay-z when he took over the brooklyn nets made the whole thing black and white and that kind of started to be the colors of the local area i just thought it was really cool so hint hint dallas what color do you think yours mm. is gonna be <laughs> Leave that as a surprise. So whenever whenever we were in New York, we also did a photo shoot. 
which was rather hysterical. It was we got <laughs> way more bloopers than actual content. Than actual content, absolutely. I think I have I have some good blackmail from Ismail for no. for a while. No, what are you talking about? <laughs> I do. PM me no, if you want to no. know what it is. I'll send you the pics. <laughs> This is what I gotta. This is what I gotta do. With. Just for the record, everyone who listens to the show, you never see me blackmail Ryan or put him on the spot. But this is what I have to go through on a daily basis. You know that is just fine, and people put me on the spot plenty. So one of the things that we did, at the, I really have to say thank you to Ismail truly because first of all, he let me do what I wanted to do, and it was really out of his comfort zone. I literally just yeah, told I've him never to show really up. done anything like that before. Uh, in the whole photography studio and photo shoots and all that. So it's definitely not something I'm used to. And, and on that note, I think we also should give a shout out to Thomas Siegel. Thomas was extremely helpful uh, to us during that whole thing. I know you listen listening to the show, Thomas, you the man. Thank you so much. Thomas bought ring lights. He brought a drone. He bought, what else did he bring? He bought like photo booths. All of a sudden there's like the inflatable booth. Like it was just everything we needed. He brought speaking, to us. Thank you so much, him, That's another thing that I walked away with through this whole experience of Ryan's visit is that we're really lucky that there's such great people out there. Like Thomas was a great, such a great guy. And there's other people in the industry like that. I know it's, sometimes we get tempted by the negativity, you know. Uh, we argue uh, online and people kind of start getting very negative, but there's really some great people in the industry. Uh, my advice to everyone is to find those people and build relationships with them because it can change everything for you. With the photo shoot, we were able to get uh, a couple of really good videos, um, a lot of unusable we tried. stuff. It was the first but time we tried. Right. <laughs> you know, I was a little bit pissed off. I brought, I went into the city, I went to Best Buy, I found the mic that I wanted, and it was just like this rather large expensive directional mic once we got it on it stopped working like it was just on and off and i i was so disappointed yeah, like that truth i mean the benefit is that people will get some comical material to laugh at so whatever i got great stuff Stay tuned, just... I, guess. <laughs> I don't know what it is either so i'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that so too. our next event is super boothers do dallas and it is september 25th at the w dallas victory um, I actually just had lunch with Taylor Martin today. She is from one of our episodes on vendor relationships. It is our most popular episode ever. Um, it just the the number of downloads in it are astronomical. It's just it's shocking to me how like that yeah. one is and, like uh, the main. You never one. know who might show up. We had a surprise guest appear at the United Gotham event. Um, so you you you, you want to be there at the Dallas one. You just don't know who'll show up. Taylor at the W is really going all out for us, and I'm super thankful to her. So thank you so much, Taylor. Um, if you need to buy tickets, you could purchase them at http colon forward slash forward slash www dot That was two forward com. slashes for everyone who missed that. <laughs> I was going over a thing today, and I read that like the guy that like I guess invented the internet and did like the code was saying that there's no reason for those slashes. Like it, it's just like the most largest time waster it's of also like knowing to say. Um, humanity but before we move on from the events i just the other thing i wanted to mention to people is that we talked about this in the networking episode where not everyone's comfortable going to these things they're introverts and there was a couple people that were introverts at our event but i've got to give them a lot of credit for you know taking the initiative to go uh one thing that i've noticed from being at the expo and being at this event is that you got to do whatever you can to go to these events whether it's ours or other events the benefits of being there of networking with people in the industry i mean it's huge the fact that you see other people there that are just like you they're regular people and they're succeeding i think that alone is worth going it gives you it gives you this energy that you take away from the event and not even succeeding i think that the energy of the room was very electric and people were just hungry they were hungry for information hungry for what we had to say i hope i delivered oh, yeah. i think i did <laughs> I, th I, th I think i can't put it into words but there's just something about the energy the vibe in the room and you walk out and you're pumped and you learn a bunch of stuff and you saw other people that were doing things that you weren't doing just that exchange of being around there it's just something that you can't put your finger on but it really benefits you this is the thing is the mood of it was just everyone who was there really wanted to be there and i re i really appreciate that i hope i hope i gave y'all good stuff i can't believe that some of y'all took a train so so far yeah, right. and, like, and, and you know what we were actually debating before the event what the program should be uh, Ryan and I, and we had the first was like a half hour, 45 minutes, be a, like a cocktail type of thing where people were talking. And I was, I was kind of worried about that. But after the event, that seemed to be what people really, they really enjoyed mingling with each other. 
uh, it was like nonstop conversations the entire time. So I was surprised to see people enjoy that that much. But it shows you that people actually network, so that's good. They're listening to the show. Okay, enough with the love fest. Moving on. We did a Facebook Live video whenever I was in New York in the studio, and I kind of wanted not to redo it again, just to kind of, I guess, go over what we talked about. I think that more people obviously listen to this than they do on Facebook Live. Um, We talked about reviews, and I really need to say thank you to Sheree Irwin for giving us a little shout-out on Photobooth Network. Um, I'm glad I said something that I guess really resonated with you. Just to go over this again, whenever we were talking about reviews, whenever we talk about reviews, one of the things that we need to discuss is you need to have one place to host all the reviews, whether it's Yelp or Wedding Wire or The Knot. Having It's like taking all of your firepower and shoving it into one avenue. So this is something that I, I definitely see the merit of having everything be on one platform. It looks way better to have 150 reviews on Wedding Wire as opposed to 10 here or 20 there or 30 there. Um, and, and just to touch on this one second, I know that a lot of people like the show because they see different perspectives. So this is a different perspective. I found that when I had one platform... If someone, if one of my clients didn't use that platform, they were less likely to leave a review. So what I ended up doing from my experience was creating a landing page on my site where I posted the different platforms I used. Let's say Wedding Wire, Google, and Yelp. And if someone that used me for their event prefers Yelp, they're able to click on Yelp and leave a review on Yelp. Um, and I know this changed recently. Ryan told me Google now allows you to do this, but in the past, they forced you to sign into your Google account in order to leave a review. And that's why a lot of people didn't use it unless they were active Google users. So because of all these combinations of different factors, I thought I'd rather just capture the review instead of losing some people and focusing on one platform. I disagree. However, Google did change. Google did change it. So now you don't have to have an account to, to leave a review. I really think it also depends on if you have a physical location or not. I think that if you have a physical location, and that could I think also Yelp be dependent is dependent on probably location. something Some better suited may, to you. Or actually, there might be strategy involved in choosing the platform that you're looking at. Like, if you predominantly focus on weddings, maybe you do Wedding Wire. If in your area there's a, not a lot of focus from your competitors on Yelp, maybe you focus on Yelp. So I think there might be some strategic thought that goes into choosing the platform that you want to focus on. Another thing is after the event, making sure that your client's happy. I send out a survey, so and it's not like a request or anything. It's just a little survey. You can do this with a couple of things. Uh, you know, happy face, smiley face, thumbs up, thumbs down. If you want to keep it to a one click. I like to do the stars thing. Um, I We actually just did this with the review for... A night in Gotham, um, having people relate to stars. I like to have the auto email go out generally about 36, 48 hours after the event happens. That way it's still fresh in their mind and they're able to give you a decent review because it's, I mean, they can still remember. I don't ask for a review, you know, a week so or two Ryan, weeks later because then it's like, well, who the hell are you? Email I just forgot. requesting a review or do, like, I know there's a lot of other things that people do after the event. They send a link to the photos. Um, they request a review. Is that all separate steps for you or do you combine them into emails? Link to the photo. I have separate steps. So my CRM software immediately sends out the photos within 30 minutes. So if the event ends at 11 p.m., they're getting an automatic text message and an email at 11.30. 20, I actually think it's 36 hours. 36 hours after that, they get another email that is a survey. And on there it says, you know, hey, how is this? Was your tenant all right? You know, were the printouts okay? Was your layout correct? All that other good stuff. If they have a problem, I want them to tell me first. That way that I have the ability to fix it. I do not want them. I don't want to just send out and fire an email that says, hey, ask for the review. And then they're pissed off and then go to, you know, whatever. This this is where I made that mistake. Three years ago, I did two sisters' weddings. One sister, her wedding went perfectly. The second sister was an entire disaster. So this is out in South Texas where we have no internet. There is literally, there's like a gas station, a Walmart and a McDonald's, and it's all the same thing. And it's the only thing within like 60 miles. The mother had given me the wrong address. So 
what originally happened was the attendant went down there. He goes, I, I'm in a dirt road. I don't know what to tell you. So it was really just a thing that was transposed. She wrote east instead of west. So he was on the other side of the highway. So he ended up getting there. I called her, couldn't get a hold of her. She finally called, pissed off, where the hell are you? I said, he's here, he's on the other side, he can't get a hold of you, please let me know what the correct address is. Sure enough, they got in contact, he ended up doing the event like the last 30 minutes, because I guess they were done at a certain time, and she had us come later on in the evening as opposed to the very beginning. So she was very pissed off, and you know, there's not a lot I can do whenever you give us the wrong information. However... Our system automatically sent out an email that said, hey, please leave a review. She left a scathing. I mean, there was blood dripping off of this thing. And it was difficult because it wasn't on a platform that I could respond to, which pisses me off. Um, since then, I think they allow us to respond to them. Uh, we... I, when did we, we talked about this in an episode previously about like getting like attorneys involved and all that other good stuff with like, like the knot, for example, has like re- legal teams to handle reviews of that, of that nature. So anyways, I needed to vow yeah, after think, that to I make sure that that, that stuff was absolutely on getting more reviews, but Ryan's hitting mm-hmm. on that important point that you should focus also on preventing bad reviews, right? Like he said, he wants to hear about it first. I'm also curious, Ryan, have you put thought into combining some of those emails? Like, what do you think about, uh, including the survey and the photos in the same email. Why do you separate them? Do you think you're over bombarding of the customer? Are you doing that on purpose? Yeah, if yeah, I'm doing it on purpose. After the event, they want their photos. They don't want to leave a review. That's not on their mind. They want to just still like continue the happiness and whatever is going on, and you know, stay on cloud nine. That's fine. Here's your photos. Great, fantastic. Share it everywhere you want to share it. Here's all the links for it. If I were to ask for a review on that email, I don't think I'd get it. I don't think I'd have a higher the higher rate that I do now whenever I separate it. So if the event is Yeah, you, know, you don't want to confuse Saturday, people by having too many calls to action or Monday purposes afternoon. in one email, you want to separate them. Um what, what is the response rate? Like how do you how often do people actually leave a review? Or do they all do they all, they all fill the survey in mostly? Every other, yeah. That leave a I, review? Um, that's a lie. Probably one in three that leave a survey. And then if if they were happy with the survey, they're always 100% going to leave a review. Like because So that's the thing. So if I get the survey back and it's like five stars everything, I'm sending them an email. Hey, thank you so much. We really appreciate this. You know, Could you leave a review on this site? And, and then I will tell them where to leave it and then give them a link to that just so it's a one click. And that's a manual step that you do? So you review the surveys manually and then you reply only to the positive ones for a review? It's a halfway manual thing. So I have another web form that I just type in their name and their email and it sends out the customized email that looks like I just hand wrote it right now. Mm. Crafty little Mexican. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so that's the thing is I want to make sure that they're happy. Yeah. I don't I don't I want to prevent a bad a bad review before it happens. Now, if there are bad reviews, I generally don't care. Um you are going to have it's also it's kind of good to have the bad reviews. Um, I know that sounds crazy to say, but there are people that just sound crazy. And whenever they type it and put down their crazy on the internet, it comes across as crazy to everyone else. Yeah, it's, it's so like that. So like that. So like that mother that wrote down whatever she wrote down, she kind of sounded crazy. It sounds counterintuitive to have bad reviews be good, but there's actually a lot of things that I've seen that say if, if there's a company with 105 star reviews, every review is perfect, it seems less believable. Uh, for consumers, but if they see a couple bad reviews in there, it somehow it makes them see the company in a more realistic light. Um, that's just something that I've read. Yeah, your human yeah. shit happens. It's more important how you react. So now that you're able to reply to those bad reviews on these platforms, um, people look to see how you react and how you handle those situations. I also wanted to say this because I had to deal with this um, a couple of times today. If anybody has a pissed off customer and you do not know how to handle it, Please message me. And this is just an open invitation. I love handling crap like this. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm sure you're going to regret doing that because you're probably going to get flooded. No. I mean, this is the thing is if you – I will give you my honest opinion. Um, there was an issue today where someone asked me, you know, hey, this is what the bride thought. Here's what we provided. Here's what is written down in the contract. Here's what she's saying. How do I handle this? Please 
let me know. I am the best one to handle this stuff. I super enjoy it. One of my friend's mothers, she worked for a rather large company, BP, and she handled a lot of stuff that went on after the oil spill. So, like, it was her responsibility to make the U.S. love BP again. Yeah. Sounds like an easy job. Um, you can imagine. You want to talk about, like, being on the firing line. Screw photo booths. <laughs> deal with a big oil spill. Yeah, I could imagine. I think the other thing that's important is that um, something as simple as just asking. A lot of people don't ask for reviews. They just think uh, people magically uh, run around and do it for them after the event. You have to ask them. And Ryan kind of touched on that with his uh, automated follow-up with the survey. So he's asking them, right? Um, the, the thing that I found works very well is communicating to the client how important reviews are to your business. Once people know, it's more likely they'll actually leave you a review because they, they, they're human. They feel like it's important to you because you communicate to them and they're more it's the empathy. empathy. So just tell them straight up that it's very important to you and they're likely to help you out. So this is also something that I'm going to start implementing that I really haven't and I really should follow my own damn advice is incentives to the attendant. Um, I don't believe in incentives to the consumer. We talked about where if you do that too often and say, oh, you know, we'll give you a free this or a free that. It's almost like bribing them. I know it's against wedding wire. um, And I think the not to give an incentive to the customer for that i do however love the idea of giving it to your attendant the irony there is that yeah it is against the terms of service but those platforms themselves offer incentives for people leaving reviews like i know wedding wire does something towards the end of the year every year where they say everyone that leaves a review gets a chance to win i think it's like ten thousand dollars so they incentivize people for you you don't even have to do that sure and if they do do that, and I know we didn't talk about this on the live show, if they do have that, I would also put that information in your email that's going out to them. Like, hey, listen, like here's – this would help us out. Also, you're entered to win you know, X, Y, and Z. Yeah, I actually think we, we briefly touched on this in the live video. I, 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 that's what I did. So I actually tried that out where I just informed – so at the end of the year, I look at all the events that we did and everyone that had a positive experience but didn't leave a review – and I send them a second batch uh, reminding them, hey, this is very important to me. Glad to have worked with you. Wedding Wire is doing this promo where you enter to win. And a lot of them actually surprisingly leave a review. So sometimes people just need that little bit of extra motivation to go in there and write something down. And having a chance at winning does that for them. Going along the lines of the empathy route, I love the idea of having the attendant ask for the review. And you know what? Let's say you offer your attendant 50 bucks if they give you a five-star review. Have the attendant say, listen, I hope you enjoyed everything. Please, if you leave a five-star review with my name in it, I get a bonus. Like, And then the attendant or the – I'm sorry, the host or whatever that's doing the event doesn't have – they're generally not going to tip. So my thing is I, I don't mind that money coming from me. I mean if they're going to get rewarded, they might as well get rewarded from me. If the host isn't going to do it. So if they're not getting a tip, just say, listen, I would really appreciate a five-star review. I get a bonus. Now you said generally they don't leave a tip. Is that how it is in Texas? So this is the thing is I'm noticing tips are more common now than they were. Right before the recession, tips were flying left and right. It was not uncommon for you to have you know, the father of the bride have a stack of envelopes, go to every single vendor, and give them an envelope. That was super common. The recession happened. That was the first thing to get cut out. I I remember I was in Houston. I did one event. Uh, I did a lot of flowers for this event, actually. And, you know, I really got along with my client. It was actually my first client in Houston. I drove out there to do her event from San Antonio. She ended up giving me a $1,000 tip. Wow. I never got another tip in Houston. <laughs> So I mean, it just it comes and goes. I mean, you know, I mean, it, it goes it goes back and forth. Now, I did an event two weeks ago where they gave us an envelope. Um, I think it's more common now. This is another thing: is back then you used to have you know parents paying for the wedding. Now you're having the couples pay for the wedding themselves, not mommy and daddy. So I think that is a huge factor as well. Um, I used to get thank you notes all the time. Um, that has kind of stopped. Um, 
I mean, but tips are a little bit more common now. Yeah, I think in my area, they're, they've always been very common. I think the major, the vast majority of people leave tips. Of course, the tip amount varies, but most of them do leave tips. See, if it's a corporate event, not so much. That is true. That's true. I agree with that. And I mean, and I do more corporate than I do social, so... Um, but no, but I love the idea of having the attendant. Just as you have a salesperson asking for the sale, you j- should have the attendant ask for the review. Do you do anything to control your attendants from being overzealous in their requests? Like, how do you prevent them from being over aggressive and salesy and pushing them to just leave a positive they're, review? They're not. I mean, they all just have. First of all, they're all pretty all laid back. I mean, if it is going on, I don't know about it. I don't, I don't think that's the case. I, yeah, you probably would have heard about I it. I mean, if it was, I'm sure I would have. But, I mean, they're yeah. they're all really chill. Hey, thank you so much. Especially after the event, whenever the event's over. I mean, they go through their spiel. Hey, your photos are going to be texted to you in a second. You're also going to get a follow-up email. If you could please just leave me a review, I'd appreciate a great thanks. And, I mean, trust me, after the event, it is a race to get the hell out the door. Like, I mean, th- that is just, a- after so many people, it's just, I'm, I'm over it. One, one other thing that stood out uh, from the last episode that we heard about from people was uh, I recommended a book. That inspired a book club. Yes. I was, I was actually really pleasantly surprised, before you jump in, very pleasantly surprised that people actually want to read. I mean, I didn't know people still did that nowadays. I didn't know you could. Uh, come on, man. I'm going to send you a picture of my bookshelf after this show. Magazines aren't books, Ismail. <laughs> One thing that was really cool to see recently was, uh, I think in the last episode I recommended a book, and a lot of people actually messaged me privately, uh, talking about the book, buying the book, sending me pictures of the book. We gave one away at the event as well. Um, so that inspired something. So we announced at A Night in Gotham that we are starting a book club. Uh, I don't know how often we're going to change up the books. The goal is probably going to be once a quarter. For sure, once a month, we're going to recommend a book. Whether or not we actually go in detail to it, we haven't really discussed yet. Um, This is the thing. Ismail recommended Ultimate Sales Machine, which is our first book. And I was like, okay, yeah, great, whatever. Like, didn't think anything of it. Then we got responses from people saying, hey, listen, I like this book. I'm like, okay, well, I guess now I have to take Ismail a little bit seriously. So this is this is how everything goes, by the way, guys. This is how everything it literally, goes. It literally does. It literally does. So I read the book. Well, I read half the book. I, I skimmed the book. I skimmed the book. I bought the book. The book is on my table. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so I actually read the first two chapters on the plane which are pretty it's it's an easily digestible book so this guy chat talks about 12 steps <laughs> get it <laughs> so in the book chat talks about like the 12 steps to becoming an ultimate sales machine so the book is very easily broken down very easily digestible i mean you could read just a chapter a day and I actually recommend you read a chapter a day because there are so many takeaways in the damn book. I mean, it is it is it is a lot. I mean, if you were to write down all the takeaways, I mean, you'd end up with a book. I mean, literally every sentence. There's there's a crazy amount of takeaways. I forgot most of the book. I think Ryan's going to go through some points and hopefully refresh my memory um, of what he's read so far. But before you do that, Ryan, I just want to again really recommend this book to people. If you're serious about growing your business, you got to be good at sales. Um, and I've actually given this book to a lot of friends of mine, and I've told them that this is probably the most important thing for them to read in order to become wealthy. More valuable than college education, more valuable than anything else. you got to learn sales. This is also another thing. One of the questions that we got at A Night in Gotham was, how do I determine when I get an assistant? And my answer to this has always been the same, and it goes for any position within your company, is Whenever you're not able to dedicate 100% of your time to it, when if you cannot do that job, perform that job at 100% efficiency, that's when you need to get someone else to do it. So if you are spread thin and your day is sucked up by graphics, you need to hire a graphics person. If your day is sucked up by sales and you can't do all the other stuff that you actually want to do, you need to hire a salesperson. That's another thing is taking apart your business and figuring out which parts you like the best. I love sales. I will sell the photo booth all damn day long. Don't ask me to work these events. I can't stand it. 
But I would argue that's the most important thing of any business is you, you need business, right? To have a business. As sales is critical. Sure. I can book the thing all day long. Don't ask me to do the event. That's one of the things that I hire out to do. Yeah, I, I would relate to you on that. I if, feel the same way. If, for example, I'm going to take a vacation for a month. And if I'm not able to do sales, that's when I need to hire a salesperson. Like this, the same thing goes is if you are if you are not able to do a certain part of your job, that's whenever you need to hire a person to fulfill that job for you. So let's jump into some of the things that you've read so far that you thought were worth talking about. So Ultimate Sales Machine, this guy talks about going into these big companies and actually think the first one was a carpet cleaning company. And he talks about how to scale a business. So the big thing was is these people had a very large client list and I think they bought about once every two years. And his job was to try and increase business. So he went in there from the aspect of you have a large client list. You need to go after these people and convince them to buy again. So I'm actually going to grab my calculator out here because this is this is going to take some math on my part. So he talks about conversion and how they had, I guess, like, let's just say like five salespeople. And with the salespeople, he goes, you need to dedicate an hour of your day to following up with people from, you know, your client list. So going back through your list, talking to these people again, saying, hey, listen, you know, here's what, and wrote a script for them. One of the things. And, and we did talk about the importance of following up in a prior episode. We did. I just want to slip that in there. We did. He talks about market data. And with the market data related to the carpet cleaning company, he goes, you know, carpet, you know, keeps bugs, it keeps dirt, it keeps dust. You need to clean it out even if you vacuum every other day. I think he said that steam cleaning it kills all the bacteria that's in there. And, you know, you have, you know, 40% cleaner air just by cleaning your carpet once every six months. I made that up. I don't know if that's true. I'm just trying to get my point across. So what he was doing is finding statistics on how clean you need to get your carpet and how often you need to do it. So he is educating his client by saying, hey, listen, this is this is what I need to do for my carpet to be clean. So for you to be healthy and for you to breathe cleaner air. Well, as a consumer, you're like, I, I was reading that and I was like, I need to clean my carpet. I don't have carpet, but I would thought I needed to clean it. I mean, that's that's the thing is your your customers may not know what they need to do and it is your job to educate them. So this is also why I, I think, Ryan, you will love this book because that's a common theme that is recurring throughout the book, selling through education. You have to educate your clients. And I think this is something that you say all the time. Oh, absolutely. You've got to tell them. Yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is the thing that pisses me off, is, and I have no problem saying this, is whenever someone, a photo booth person will say, oh, this person's cheap. That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. There are times where this customer may not know what is a normal cost, especially if you don't have your cost listed. Well, you know, I have I have had clients that I have asked this after the fact, and I said, "Oh, well, how much do you think you want to spend?" Well, three hundred dollars. Well, they don't know what the hell three hundred dollars buys. They, I had a client, and I asked her this question. I said, "Why did you say that?" She goes, "I didn't know any other number." So it pisses me off whenever people, "Oh, they're cheap." Well. No, they're not. They're just uneducated. They don't know what things cost. They don't know how much time goes into it. So how do you educate them to a higher price? Well, that's a different episode. Um, Stay tuned, guys. That's a different episode because I could go off on a tangent on that one. So what he was doing is he was training the salespeople to go over the script, and the script was full of market data. And in the market data, he was saying how it went to, you know, you need to pitch this to your customers for an hour. So this one salesperson pitched it to 10 people. Two people scheduled and bought it. So that is 20%. So he goes, at the end of the hour, he goes, so how did it go? And they're like, you know, uh, didn't go well. I remember this. He goes, you know, didn't go well. Well, why didn't it go well? Well, only two people bought it. Two people bought out of 10. That's 20%. Standard conversion, good conversion for website is like between 3 and 5%. If you got 20%, that's freaking amazing. So let's do this. So let's say your client list is 5,000 people. You have your salespeople contact those 5,000 people 
and say, hey, listen, do you want to buy? If that number stands correct, which I think was true, 20% of those should convert. On that list of 5,000 people, that means that 1,000 people are buying. If each carpet cleaning is, let's say, $500, that is an extra $500,000 per year. Imagine if you did that in photo booths. This is the same thing. There is a PDF that I talk about. It's, uh, it's my flash sale PDF. Again, it, a flash sale I don't recommend for everyone. However, if you use it correctly, it is a way to generate a large influx of cash if you need it. I'm not saying that everyone should do it. And there's you can download the PDF and I go through everything that you need to talk about. But this is the thing is, had it been up to that one salesperson... They would have stopped. Yes, they would have stopped. Do you want $500,000 extra per year? That's so fascinating, man. It, 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 this, it, is, it, this is simple spoke, math. This is simple statistics. This is eighth grade math, people. But you spoke about the client being uneducated. That's a little bit about business people not being educated enough to know what is a good conversion rate. Like that person thought that was bad. And yeah, absolutely. If, if they were the business owner, they would have stopped. If, it, little- if an hour... So let's go off of the 500 I don't know what the t- total amount was. If the fi- if the $500 amount was the amount per person, that person would have made $1000. And you know it wasn't successful. Well why why don't you think it was successful because eight people didn't buy it because everybody didn't buy it? No, that's not the case. This is a certain amount of people converting. 3 to 5% is standard conversion on anything on cold calls, on, you know, web ads, whatever. 3% Three yeah, percent is good. I, I think the two things that I take away from that is that you got to be following up first and foremost. Secondly, selling through education. Like they didn't just call everyone and say, "Hey, do you want to get carpet cleaned?" They educated the clients as to why they should have their carpets cleaned, and the combination of the follow up and the education is the real magic. But here. this is the thing: is they're selling the problem. They're selling the solution to the problem first. They're not saying, hey, do you want to have your carpets clean? I'll do it for this much. They're, they're not doing that. They're telling you why you need to have your carpets clean. That's such a like a critical point, and people can just gloss over it. That is gold right there. I've said this a million times. You need to be the solution. Help solve the damn problem. You know, that's another thing that on this note at the event. Some, a lot of people ask, how do you sell iPad booths and communicate the value of iPad booths? And I thought you had a great answer about you talk about what it can do. Right. Absolutely. I sell what it does. I don't, I don't sell what it looks like, Yeah. which helps a million times because if I ever got into a bind, all I need is someone that uses the exact same iPad software that I use. I don't need anything else. They could show up with a, they can show up with, you know, someone holding the damn iPad, taking the pictures. I'm selling what it can do, not what it looks like. And, And this was just the first chapter of the book or not even the first chapter. Did you have another point? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I have I have I have a little list here. Wow. So and it's not a long list, so it's all right. So another thing is, and something that uh, one of my good friends does is uh, that can be applied to our industry. I wrote it down. I don't know what the hell he talked about in the book was, but it's just reminded me of a point. Is whenever you get these events that happen every year, I have one conference that is happens every year in the same spot. What I do is I lock them into a three-year contract and give it to them generally at about a 50% reduced rate. So if they agree with me – and this is the thing is you can't – there's an art to doing this. You can't go into your first event and say, hey, listen, let's do this for three – don't do that. You have to – I would say if you've done the year for two years in a – if you've done the event for two years in a row – Then you can go to them and say, hey, listen, we can do a three-year contract. I'll give it to you for a lower rate each year. You've just locked in that business for three years. Depending on how much it is, let's say you're doing that event for $2,000. You've just guaranteed yourself $6,000 for the next three years. What would you tell someone who says, you know what? I'm going to get them anyway. Why would I give them a discount? They've been using me for years. They're going to come back to me first again next year. Why would I give up that? Stupid. Stupid, stupid, stupid. What if the main contact leaves? Then you're absolutely screwed. Then that other contact can go off somewhere else and you know, you're know you just left in the wind. So you value more the security of the income rather than the actual 
fifteen percent more, whatever the number is. Yeah, what and it doesn't even have to be fifteen percent. But this is the thing: is what I've done with those is I've told those clients, "Hey, I'll do your event, you know, for the next three years, and I'll give you whatever cool thing I'm doing." Then they love it because they get it at a reduced rate. I love it because I'm guaranteed the cash and I can do whatever the hell I want. My, my, I, I am very unique in the fact that my clients do not care. My clients love what I come up with. And that's the thing. Sometimes it's not even groundbreaking. That's the crazy part. Most times it's not. <laughs> well, I would – yeah, absolutely, just because of the sheer volume. But, you know, I, I'm doing an event for um, – it's a children's festival they're doing a superhero theme they're just saying hey do whatever you want so we're doing you know the video background we're doing you know capes we're doing masks great fantastic so another thing is getting your salespeople and yourself to commit to one hour per week for sales which that's that's a sales thing in general if you say one hour per week in a hotel you'll probably lose your job it's generally an hour a day um, and you have to cold call, you know, at least X amount of people. Um, that is something that I absolutely could do. And that is just to, you know, reintroduce, Hey, you know what? You go through your last year first. Hey, look at all the events I did last year. Take out all the weddings first. Cause they're not going to book again, you know, unless you have some sort of like habitual bride. Um, speaking of habitual, it talks about anytime you start, something on a routine it takes 21 times for it to become a habit yeah there's a lot of studies that back that up actually we haven't hit 21 episodes yet so i can still drop out on you (laughs) good to know good to know so this is another thing is don't pick up the phone unless you can spend 30 minutes on the phone with your customer like if you're headed out the door or gonna head out the door don't pick up the phone because once you get stuck on the phone, you need to be able to be on the phone for 30 minutes to answer everyone's questions. Don't pick up the phone assuming it's going to be a five-minute conversation. And the last two things that I learned was to eat the frog and how do you eat an elephant. These are two good ones. Elaborate, please. So eat the frog is whenever you take the most difficult part of your day and put it right up at the top and do it first. I love this. Whenever yep. this is the thing is whenever you have a to do, he talks about to do list a lot. I have to do list. I have that big little like butcher paper thing. It looks like a toilet paper roll that like I write all my to do lists on, and it's I it's very cathartic as so much of a digital person that I am. My calendar and my to do list are always handwritten. That's just me. I'm, I'm I don't know. I just like that. Um, People may have heard about the eat the frog thing. It's a common you know thing that's. Common theme, common theme, but this is – if you have anxiety, <laughs> if you do the little menial stupid tasks that are just easy, you will have anxiety all day long until you complete whatever you're trying to finish. Whenever you, whenever you do it at the top of your day, it's done. It's over. You're free to go about your day entirely relaxed. It's very tempting to go after the easy little things that – Don't really move the needle for your business. I think that if you haven't done this before, you should experiment with it. I know some people that can't eat the frog in the beginning. They have to build momentum, you know, and you have to to find what what works with with you. But you should try to experiment with doing the big task in the beginning of the day. It sets the tone. You move the needle. You got something important done, and then you can move on to the little stuff that are not as important. Yeah, like I used I used to hate doing this. If ever you have, you know, you get an email. And it's of a very complicated client. You do not want to deal with this person. Do it number one. You will feel 10 times better. And there were times where, you know, I got an email, thought someone was pissed off, put it 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 off. Finally, you call. It wasn't even that big of a deal. Like oftentimes we work ourselves up for things to be like completely worse than they actually are. What about the elephant? How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Mm. Tweetable. Tweetable. <laughs> that's that's the thing is whenever you have really, really, really large product projects that just seem impossible, just doing it little by little by little by little and eventually it'll all get done. Yeah, I mean even if you do one step a day, after a year you're 365 steps ahead. That's a lot, man. People, people underestimate the impact of 
little slow progress each day. This also, this also, it's a little bit off topic, but it also goes to weight loss. Um, whenever you know you first start working out, you know only walk a half mile, and then you know do that three days a week. Then walk a mile, do that days three days a week. You know, then do two, do three, do four, do five. Next thing you know, you can run a half marathon. That's totally true. I know it's a little off topic, but I got to bring this up. I actually tried to cut sugar out of my diet, and I, I used to put like three spoons or four spoons of sugar and coffee and i had a lot of my god yeah, i had a lot of coffee every day so you had a lot of diabetes every day it's very bad for you I, I watched some documentaries i was like no no more but to tell someone to completely cut it out it's very unrealistic bad idea so i, bad I idea. went from three spoons to two and a half and then two and then one and three quarters and that little progress along the way got me to eventually not having any sugar in my coffee at all that's the thing is whenever you cut out sugar like that and then let's say you go on like a month without sugar and then like you take a drink of like a soda, it's too sugary for you yeah. and your body that's has already way. acclimated to me and then you can't like – you can't do yeah, it. that's so true. I mean and this goes this goes with everything. Just eating the elephant is something that can be applied just in life. Yeah. This is not just about photo booths, people. I'm talking about life here. So we are going to give away this book. We are giving away this book on Friday. If you want to enter, go to superboothers.com slash book club. Fill in your information, so and we will enter. announce the winner on Friday. Yeah, I'm excited. Um, we, we're not really sure how this is going to go. Like Brian said, we might do it quarterly. Um, but the point is that everyone reads the book. You have time to read it, and then maybe we'll do a show. Maybe we'll do a discussion. Maybe we'll do a live video. We don't know yet. Uh, but we'd like to have a common book that we all read that will actually move the needle for our business and then somehow communicate about it. And for the people out there that don't like to read, you're listening to a podcast, you can sign up for Audible. Go to audibletrial.com slash superboothers, and you get your first book free. Um, so you can get this book and listen to it while you're driving and still get the same content. Thank you so much for listening to Ismail's birthday episode. Can I get in here for my birthday? Happy birthday. Yeah, look at you that. You can. He's talking during the outro, people. This is unprecedented. Check out superboothers.com for the book club, for tickets to Superboothers Do Dallas. If you have any questions that you would like to submit, please go to superboothers.com slash ask superboothers. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next week.